Chapter 1 My uncle makes a great discovery. Looking back to all that has occurred to me since that eventful day, I am scarcely able to believe in the reality of my adventures. They were truly so wonderful that even now I am bewildered when I think of them. My uncle was a German, having married my mother's sister, an Englishwoman. Being very much attached to his fatherless nephew, he invited me to study under him in his home in the fatherland. This home was in a large town, and my uncle a professor of philosophy, chemistry, geology, mineralogy, and many other ologies. One day, after passing some hours in the laboratory, my uncle being absent at the time, I suddenly felt the necessity of renovating the tissues, i.e., I was hungry, and was about to rouse up our old French cook, when my uncle, Professor von Hardwig, suddenly opened the street door, and came rushing upstairs. Now Professor Hardwig, my worthy uncle, is by no means a bad sort of man, he is, however, choleric and original. To bear with him means to obey, and scarcely had his heavy feet resounded within our joint domicile than he shouted for me to attend upon him. Harry, 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 I hastened to obey, but before I could reach his room, jumping three steps at a time, he was stamping his right foot upon the landing. Harry! He cried, in a frantic tone, are you coming up? Now to tell the truth, at that moment, I was far more interested in the question as to what was to constitute our dinner than in any problem of science. To me soup was more interesting than soda, an omelette more tempting than arithmetic, and an artichoke of ten times more value than any amount of asbestos. But my uncle was not a man to be kept waiting, so adjourning therefore all minor questions, I presented myself before him. He was a very learned man. Now most persons in this category supply themselves with information, as peddlers do with goods, for the benefit of others, and lay up stores in order to diffuse them abroad for the benefit of society in general. Not so my excellent uncle, Professor Hardwig. He studied, he consumed the midnight oil, he poured over heavy tomes, and digested huge quartos and folios in order to keep the knowledge acquired to himself. There was a reason, and it may be regarded as a good one, why my uncle objected to display his learning more than was absolutely necessary, he stammered, and when intent upon explaining the phenomena of the heavens, was apt to find himself at fault, and allude in such a vague way to sun, moon, and stars that few were able to comprehend his meaning. To tell the honest truth, when the right word would not come, it was generally replaced by a very powerful adjective. In connection with the sciences there are many almost unpronounceable names, names very much resembling those of Welsh villages, and my uncle being very fond of using them, his habit of stammering was not thereby improved. In fact, there were periods in his discourse when he would finally give up and swallow his discomfiture in a glass of water. As I said, my uncle, Professor Hardwig, was a very learned man, and I now had a most kind relative. I was bound to him by the double ties of affection and interest. I took deep interest in all his doings, and hoped some day to be almost as learned myself. It was a rare thing for me to be absent from his lectures. Like him, I preferred mineralogy to all the other sciences. My anxiety was to gain real knowledge of the earth. Geology and mineralogy were to us the sole objects of life, and in connection with these studies many a fair specimen of stone, chalk, or metal did we break with our hammers. Steel rods, lodestones, glass pipes, and bottles of various acids were oftener before us than our meals. My uncle Hardwig was once known to classify 600 different geological specimens by their weight, hardness, feasibility, sound, taste, and smell. 
He corresponded with all the great, learned, and scientific men of the age. I was, therefore, in constant communication with, at all events the letters of, Sir Humphrey Davy, Captain Franklin, and other great men. But before I state the subject on which my uncle wished to confer with me, I must say a word about his personal appearance. Alas! My readers will see a very different portrait of him at a future time, after he has gone through the fearful adventures yet to be related. My uncle was fifty years old, tall, thin, and wiry. Large spectacles hid, to a certain extent, his vast, round, and goggle eyes, while his nose was irreverently compared to a thin file. So much indeed did it resemble that useful article, that a compass was said in his presence to have made cons considerable n nasal deviation. The truth being told, however, the only article really attracted to my uncle's nose was tobacco. Another peculiarity of his was, that he always stepped a yard at a time, clenched his fists, as if he were going to hit you, and was, when in one of his peculiar humors, very far from a pleasant companion. It is further necessary to observe that he lived in a very nice house, in that very nice street, the Konigstrasse at Hamburg. Though lying in the center of a town, it was perfectly rural in its aspect half wood, half bricks, with old-fashioned gables one of the few old houses spared by the Great Fire of 1842. When I say a nice house, I mean a handsome house old, tottering, and not exactly comfortable to English notions, a house a little off the perpendicular and inclined to fall into the neighboring canal, exactly the house for a wandering artist to depict all the more that you could scarcely see it for ivy and a magnificent old tree which grew over the door. My uncle was rich. His house was his own property, while he had a considerable private income. To my notion the best part of his possessions was his goddaughter, Gretchen. And the old cook, the young lady, the professor, and I were the sole inhabitants. I loved mineralogy, I loved geology. To me there was nothing like pebbles, and if my uncle had been in a little less of a fury, we should have been the happiest of families. To prove the excellent Hardwig's impatience, I solemnly declare that when the flowers in the drawing room pots began to grow, he rose every morning at four o'clock to make them grow quicker by pulling the leaves. Having described my uncle, I will now give an account of our interview. He received me in his study, a perfect museum, containing every natural curiosity that can well be imagined minerals, however, predominating. Everyone was familiar to me, having been catalogued by my own hand. My uncle, apparently oblivious of the fact that he had summoned me to his presence, was absorbed in a book. He was particularly fond of early editions, tall copies, and unique works. Wonderful! He cried, tapping his forehead. Wonderful, wonderful! It was one of those yellow-leaved volumes now rarely found on stalls, and to me it appeared to possess but little value. My uncle, however, was in raptures. He admired its binding, the clearness of its characters, the ease with which it opened in his hand, and repeated aloud, half a dozen times, that it was very, very old. To my fancy he was making a great fuss about nothing, but it was not my province to say so. On the contrary, I professed considerable interest in the subject, and asked him what it was about. It is the Heims Kringle of Snor Tarleson, he said, the celebrated Icelandic author of the 12th century. It is a true and correct account of the Norwegian princes who reigned in Iceland. My next question related to the language in which it was written. I hoped at all events it was translated into German. 
My uncle was indignant at the very thought and declared he wouldn't give a penny for a translation. His delight was to have found the original work in the Icelandic tongue, which he declared to be one of the most magnificent and yet simple idioms in the world while at the same time its grammatical combinations were the most varied known to students. About as easy as German? Was my insidious remark. My uncle shrugged his shoulders. The letters at all events, I said, are rather difficult of comprehension. It is a runic manuscript, the language of the original population of Iceland, invented by Odin himself, cried my uncle, angry at my ignorance. I was about to venture upon some misplaced joke on the subject, when a small scrap of parchment fell out of the leaves. Like a hungry man snatching at a morsel of bread, the professor seized it. It was about five inches by three and was scrawled over in the most extraordinary fashion. The lines shown here are an exact facsimile of what was written on the venerable piece of parchment and have wonderful importance, as they induced my uncle to undertake the most wonderful series of adventures which ever fell to the lot of human beings. My uncle looked keenly at the document for some moments and then declared that it was runic. The letters were similar to those in the book, but then what did they mean? This was exactly what I wanted to know. Now as I had a strong conviction that the runic alphabet and dialect were simply an invention to mystify poor human nature, I was delighted to find that my uncle knew as much about the matter as I did which was nothing. At all events the tremulous motion of his fingers made me think so. And yet, he muttered to himself, it is old Icelandic, I am sure of it. And my uncle ought to have known, for he was a perfect polyglot dictionary in himself. He did not pretend, like a certain learned pundit, to speak the two thousand languages and four thousand idioms made use of in different parts of the globe, but he did know all the more important ones. It is a matter of great doubt to me now, to what violent measures my uncle's impetuosity might have led him, had not the clock struck two, and our old French cook called out to let us know that dinner was on the table. Bother the dinner! cried my uncle. But as I was hungry, I sallied forth to the dining room, where I took up my usual quarters. Out of politeness I waited three minutes, but no sign of my uncle, the professor. I was surprised. He was not usually so blind to the pleasure of a good dinner. It was the acme of German luxury parsley soup, a ham omelette with sorrel trimmings, an oyster of veal stewed with prunes, delicious fruit, and sparkling moselle. For the sake of poring over this musty old piece of parchment, my uncle forbore to share our meal. To satisfy my conscience, I ate for both. The old cook and housekeeper was nearly out of her mind. After taking so much trouble, to find her master not appear at dinner was to her a sad disappointment which, as she occasionally watched the havoc I was making on the viands, became also alarm. If my uncle were to come to table after all? Suddenly, just as I had consumed the last apple and drunk the last glass of wine, a terrible voice was heard at no great distance. It was my uncle roaring for me to come to him. I made very nearly one leap of it so loud, so fierce was his tone.
the mysterious parchment. I declare, cried my uncle, striking the table fiercely with his fist, I declare to you it is runic and contains some wonderful secret, which I must get at, at any price. I was about to reply when he stopped me. Sit down, he said, quite fiercely, and write to my dictation. I obeyed. I will substitute, he said, a letter of our alphabet for that of the runic, we will then see what that will produce. Now, begin and make no mistakes. The dictation commenced with the following incomprehensible result. MMRNLLS S rule SEEKJDE SGTSSMF UNTIF NIDRKA KT SAM Atretes Sayedrin Mni Nuact Rilsa Atvar Atvar Dot NSCRC IABS Kadermai Util Frantu DT IAC Osibo KDIY Scarcely giving me time to finish, my uncle snatched the document from my hands and examined it with the most rapt and deep attention. I should like to know what it means, he said, after a long period. I certainly could not tell him, nor did he expect me to his conversation being uniformly answered by himself. I declare it puts me in mind of a cryptograph, he cried, unless, indeed, the letters have been written without any real meaning, and yet why take so much trouble? Who knows but I may be on the verge of some great discovery. My candid opinion was that it was all rubbish. But this opinion I kept carefully to myself, as my uncle's collar was not pleasant to bear. All this time he was comparing the book with the parchment. The manuscript volume and the smaller document are written in different hands, he said. The cryptograph is of much later date than the book. There is an undoubted proof of the correctness of my surmise. An irrefragable proof I took it to be. The first letter is a double M, which was only added to the Icelandic language in the 12th century. This makes the parchment 200 years posterior to the volume. The circumstances appeared very probable and very logical, but it was all surmise to me. To me it appears probable that this sentence was written by some owner of the book. Now who was the owner? is the next important question. Perhaps by great good luck it may be written somewhere in the volume. With these words Professor Hardwig took off his spectacles and, taking a powerful magnifying glass, examined the book carefully. On the fly leaf was what appeared to be a blot of ink but on examination proved to be a line of writing almost defaced by time. This was what he sought, and, after some considerable time, he made out these letters, Arn Saknesem. He cried in a joyous and triumphant tone, that is not only an Icelandic name, but of a learned professor of the 16th century, a celebrated alchemist. I bowed as a sign of respect. These alchemists, he continued, Avicenna, Bacon, Lully, Paracelsus, were the true, the only learned men of the day. They made surprising discoveries. May not this Sacknus M, nephew mine, have hidden on this bit of parchment some astounding invention?
I believe the cryptograph to have a profound meaning which I must make out. My uncle walked about the room in a state of excitement almost impossible to describe. It may be so, sir, I timidly observed, but why conceal it from posterity, if it be a useful, a worthy discovery? Why how should I know? Did not Galileo make a secret of his discoveries in connection with Saturn? But we shall see. Until I discover the meaning of this sentence, I will neither eat nor sleep. My dear uncle, I began. Nor you neither, he added. It was lucky I had taken double allowance that day. In the first place, he continued, there must be a clue to the meaning. If we could find that, the rest would be easy enough. I began seriously to reflect. The prospect of going without food and sleep was not a promising one, so I determined to do my best to solve the mystery. My uncle, meanwhile, went on with his soliloquy. The way to discover it is easy enough. In this document there are 132 letters, giving 79 consonants to 53 vowels. This is about the proportion found in most southern languages, the idioms of the north being much more rich in consonants. We may confidently predict, therefore, that we have to deal with a southern dialect. Nothing could be more logical. Now, said Professor Hardwig, to trace the particular language. As Shakespeare says, that is the question, was my rather satirical reply. This man Sacknesem, he continued, was a very learned man. Now as he did not write in the language of his birthplace, he probably, like most learned men of the 16th century, wrote in Latin. If, however, I prove wrong in this guess, we must try Spanish, French, Italian, Greek, and even Hebrew. My own opinion, though, is decidedly in favor of Latin. This proposition startled me. Latin was my favorite study, and it seemed sacrilege to believe this gibberish to belong to the country of Virgil. Barbarous Latin, in all probability, continued my uncle, but still Latin. Very probably, I replied, not to contradict him. Let us see into the matter, continued my uncle. Here you see we have a series of 132 letters, apparently thrown pell-mell upon paper, without method or organization. There are words which are composed wholly of consonants, such as MMRNLLS, others which are nearly all vowels, the fifth, for instance, which is unteeth, and one of the last osibo. This appears an extraordinary combination. Probably we shall find that the phrase is arranged according to some mathematical plan. No doubt a certain sentence has been written out, and then jumbled up some plan to which some figure is the clue. Now, Harry, to show your English wit, what is that figure? I could give him no hint. My thoughts were indeed far away. While he was speaking I had caught sight of the portrait of my cousin Gretchen, and was wondering when she would return. We were affianced, and loved one another very sincerely. But my uncle, who never thought even of such sublunary matters, knew nothing of this. Without noticing my abstraction, the professor began reading the puzzling cryptograph all sorts of ways, according to some theory of his own. Presently, rousing my wandering attention, 
he dictated one precious attempt to me. I mildly handed it over to him. It read as follows. Mesunka senre dot I sefto k dot segnitamert nesertsaret, rotave sadua, ed nexed sadn la cartni or siratrax are mutabled mac maritark silucoas lefanesenai. I could scarcely keep from laughing, while my uncle, on the contrary, got in a towering passion, struck the table with his fist, darted out of the room, out of the house, and then taking to his heels was presently lost to sight. Chapter 3 an astounding discovery. What is the matter? Cried the cook, entering the room, when will master have his dinner? Never. And his supper? I don't know. He says he will eat no more, neither shall I. My uncle has determined to fast, and make me fast until he makes out this abominable inscription, I replied. You will be starved to death, she said. I was very much of the same opinion, but not liking to say so, sent her away, and began some of my usual work of classification. But try as I might, nothing could keep me from thinking alternately of the stupid manuscript and of the pretty Gretchen. Several times I thought of going out, but my uncle would have been angry at my absence. At the end of an hour, my allotted task was done. How to pass the time? I began by lighting my pipe. Like all other students, I delighted in tobacco, and seating myself in the great armchair, I began to think. Where was my uncle? I could easily imagine him tearing along some solitary road, gesticulating, talking to himself, cutting the air with his cane, and still thinking of the absurd bit of hieroglyphics. Would he hit upon some clue? Would he come home in better humor? While these thoughts were passing through my brain, I mechanically took up the execrable puzzle, and tried every imaginable way of grouping the letters. I put them together by twos, by threes, fours, and fives in vain. Nothing intelligible came out, except that the 14th, 15th, and 16th made ice in English, the 84th, 85th, and 86th, the word sir, then at last I seemed to find the Latin words rota, mutabile, ira, nec, atra. Ha! There seems to be some truth in my uncle's notion, thought I. Then again I seemed to find the word lucko, which means sacred wood. Then in the third line I appeared to make out labeled, a perfect Hebrew word, and at the last the syllables mir, ar, mer, which were French. It was enough to drive one mad. For different idioms in this absurd phrase. What connection could there be between ice, sir, anger, cruel, sacred wood changing, mother, r, and c? The first and the last might, in a sentence connected with Iceland, mean sea of ice. But what of the rest of this monstrous cryptograph? I was, in fact, fighting against an insurmountable difficulty. My brain was almost on fire. My eyes were strained with staring at the parchment. The whole absurd collection of letters appeared to dance before my vision in a number of black little groups. My mind was possessed with temporary hallucination I was stifling. I wanted air. Mechanically I fanned myself with the document, of which now I saw the back and then the front. Imagine my surprise when glancing at the back of the wearisome puzzle, the ink having gone through, I clearly made out Latin words, and among others crate rem and terrester. I had discovered the secret. It came upon me like a flash of lightning. I had got the clue. 
All you had to do to understand the document was to read it backwards. All the ingenious ideas of the professor were realized. He had dictated it rightly to me. By a mere accident I had discovered what he so much desired. My delight, my emotion may be imagined, my eyes were dazzled, and I trembled so that at first I could make nothing of it. One look, however, would tell me all I wished to know. Let me read, I said to myself, after drawing a long breath. I spread it before me on the table, I passed my finger over each letter, I spelled it through, in my excitement I read it out. What horror and stupefaction took possession of my soul. I was like a man who had received a knockdown blow. Was it possible that I really read the terrible secret, and it had really been accomplished? A man had dared to do what? No living being should ever know. Never, cried I, jumping up. Never shall my uncle be made aware of the dread secret. He would be quite capable of undertaking the terrible journey. Nothing would check him, nothing stop him. Worse, he would compel me to accompany him, and we should be lost forever. But no, such folly and madness cannot be allowed. I was almost beside myself with rage and fury. My worthy uncle is already nearly mad, I cried aloud. This would finish him. By some accident he may make the discovery, in which case, we are both lost. Perish the fearful secret, let the flames forever bury it in oblivion. I snatched up book and parchment, and was about to cast them into the fire, when the door opened and my uncle entered. I had scarcely time to put down the wretched documents before my uncle was by my side. He was profoundly absorbed. His thoughts were evidently bent on the terrible parchment. Some new combination, combination had probably struck him while taking his walk. He seated himself in his armchair, and with a pen began to make an algebraical calculation. I watched him with anxious eyes. My flesh crawled as it became probable that he would discover the secret. His combinations I knew now were useless, I having discovered the one only clue. For three mortal hours he continued without speaking a word, without raising his head, scratching, rewriting, calculating over and over again. I knew that in time he must hit upon the right phrase. The letters of every alphabet have only a certain number of combinations. But then years might elapse before he would arrive at the correct solution. Still time went on, night came, the sounds in the streets ceased and still my uncle went on, not even answering our worthy cook when she called us to supper. I did not dare to leave him, so waved her away, and at last fell asleep on the sofa. When I awoke my uncle was still at work. His red eyes, his pallid countenance, his matted hair, his feverish hands, his hectically flushed cheeks, showed how terrible had been his struggle with the impossible, and what fearful fatigue he had undergone during that long sleepless night. It made me quite ill to look at him. Though he was rather severe with me, I loved him, and my heart ached at his sufferings. He was so overcome by one idea that he could not even get in a passion. All his energies were focused on one point. And I knew that by speaking one little word all this suffering would cease. I could not speak it. 
my heart was nevertheless inclining towards him. Why then did I remain silent? In the interest of my uncle himself, nothing shall make me speak, I muttered. He will want to follow in the footsteps of the other. I know him well. His imagination is a perfect volcano, and to make discoveries in the interests of geology he would sacrifice his life. I will therefore be silent and strictly keep the secret I have discovered. To reveal it would be suicidal. He would not only rush himself to destruction, but drag me with him. I crossed my arms, looked another way and smoke resolved never to speak. When our cook wanted to go out to market, or on any other errand, she found the front door locked and the key taken away. Was this done purposely or not? Surely Professor Hardwig did not intend the old woman and myself to become martyrs to his obstinate will. Were we to be starved to death? A frightful recollection came to my mind. Once we had fed on bits and scraps for a week while he sorted some curiosities. It gave me the cramp even to think of it. I wanted my breakfast, and I saw no way of getting it. Still my resolution held good. I would starve rather than yield. But the cook began to take me seriously to task. What was to be done? She could not go out, and I dared not. My uncle continued counting and writing. His imagination seemed to have translated him to the skies. He neither thought of eating nor drinking. In this way twelve o'clock came round. I was hungry, and there was nothing in the house. The cook had eaten the last bit of bread. This could not go on. It did, however, until two, when my sensations were terrible. After all, I began to think the document very absurd. Perhaps it might only be a gigantic hoax. Besides, some means would surely be found to keep my uncle back from attempting any such absurd expedition. On the other hand, if he did attempt anything so quixotic, I should not be compelled to accompany him. Another line of reasoning partially decided me. Very likely he would make the discovery himself when I should have suffered starvation for nothing. Under the influence of hunger this reasoning appeared admirable. I determined to tell all. The question now arose as to how it was to be done. I was still dwelling on the thought when he rose and put on his hat. What? Go out and lock us in? Never. Uncle, I began. He did not appear even to hear me. Professor Hardwig, I cried. What, he retorted, did you speak? How about the key? What key the key of the door? Know of these horrible hieroglyphics? He looked at me from under his spectacles and started at the odd expression of my face. Rushing forward, he clutched me by the arm and keenly examined my countenance. His very look was an interrogation. I simply nodded. With an incredulous shrug of the shoulders, he turned upon his heel. Undoubtedly he thought I had gone mad. I have made a very important discovery. His eyes flashed with excitement. His hand was lifted in a menacing attitude. For a moment neither of us spoke. It is hard to say which was most excited. You don't mean to say that you have any idea of the meaning of the scrawl? I do, was my desperate reply. Look at the sentences dictated by you. Well, but it means nothing, was the angry answer. 
Nothing if you read from left to right, but mark if from right to left backwards. Cried my uncle in wild amazement. Almost cunning Sacknesson, and I'd be such a blockhead. He snatched up the document, gazed at it with haggard eye, and read it out as I had done. It read as follows. In Sneffels Yaculus Crate Rem Cam Delibat Umbris Cartaris Juli Intra Calendas Descend, Otis Viator, E.T. Terrestre Centrum Atinges. Cod Fisi. Arn Sacknesem which dog Latin being translated, reads as follows. Descend into the crater of Yokel of Sneffels, which the shade of Scartaris caresses, before the Calends of July, audacious traveler, and you will reach the center of the earth. I did it. Arn Sacknesem my uncle leaped three feet from the ground with joy. He looked radiant and handsome. He rushed about the room wild with delight and satisfaction. He knocked over tables and chairs. He threw his books about until at last, utterly exhausted, he fell into his armchair. What's a clock? He asked. About three. My dinner does not seem to have done me much good, he observed. Let me have something to eat. We can then start at once. Get my portmanteau ready. What for? And your own, he continued. We start at once. My horror may be conceived. I resolved, however, to show no fear. Scientific reasons were the only ones likely to influence my uncle. Now, there were many against this terrible journey. The very idea of going down to the center of the earth was simply absurd. I determined therefore to argue the point after dinner. My uncle's rage was now directed against the cook for having no dinner ready. My explanation however satisfied him, and having gotten the key, she soon contrived to get sufficient to satisfy her voracious appetites. During the repast my uncle was rather gay than otherwise. He made some of those peculiar jokes which belong exclusively to the learned. As soon, however, as dessert was over, he called me to his study. We each took a chair on opposite sides of the table. Henry, he said, in a soft and winning voice, I have always believed you ingenious, and you have rendered me a service never to be forgotten. Without you, this great, this wondrous discovery would never have been made. It is my duty, therefore, to insist on your sharing the glory. He is in a good humor, thought I, I'll soon let him know my opinion of glory. In the first place, he continued, you must keep the whole affair a profound secret. There is no more envious race of men than scientific discoverers. Many would start on the same journey. At all events, we will be the first in the field. I doubt your having many competitors, was my reply. A man of real scientific acquirements would be delighted at the chance. We should find a perfect stream of pilgrims on the traces of Arn Sacknesem, if this document were once made public. But, my dear sir, is not this paper very likely to be a hoax? I urged. The book in which we find it is sufficient proof of its authenticity, he replied. I thoroughly allow that the celebrated professor wrote the lines, but only, I believe, as a kind of mystification, was my answer. Scarcely were the words out of my mouth, when I was sorry I had uttered them. My uncle looked at me with a dark and gloomy skull, and I began to be alarmed for the results of our conversation. His mood soon changed, however, and a smile took the place of a frown. We shall see, he remarked, with decisive emphasis. But see, 
What is all this about yokel and snuffles and this scartaris? I have never heard anything about them. The very point to which I am coming. I lately received from my friend Augustus Peterman of Leipzig a map. Take down the third atlas from the second shelf, series Z, plate 4. I rose, went to the shelf, and presently returned with the volume indicated. This, said my uncle, is one of the best maps of Iceland. I believe it will settle all your doubts, difficulties, and objections. With a grim hope to the contrary, I stooped over the map.